Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Mad Mom Looks. I'm your host, Summer, here with my new co-host, Noor, who you may remember from our sleight of hand episode and her own podcast, Between Arabs. She's now joined the Mad Mom Looks team. Welcome, Noor. Thank you so much, Summer. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. We're hijacking this male-dominated podcast group and redeeming it from its patriarchal past. This is really exciting. This is kind of a, a it's pretty much a big deal um, because there really hasn't been an episode of only female hosts, I think, ever on the Mad Mom yeah. Looks, right? I think uh, Mahin is getting worried now about getting them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the first things Mahin said um, when I joined the group a few weeks ago is, uh, "You better not steal my my role as the opener." <laughs> um, I'm not I'm not stealing your role, Mahin. Don't worry. But anyone can make an, as many polygamy jokes as Mahin can. So exactly. there will always be a place for him here. <laughs> there will always be a place for that. Yeah, and just not on this episode. <laughs> We're we're really lucky because um, in keeping with the spirit of sisterhood, we've actually got a great episode for our listeners tonight. The incredible Hira Hashmi is with us. And for many of our listeners, she really doesn't need an introduction. She's known primarily for spearheading the famous Muslims Condemn List back in March of this year. Hira is a 19-year-old Muslim-American woman who is behind the 712-page list of Muslim names that condemns a collection of wrongdoings done falsely in the name of Islam, anything from acts of terrorism to climate change. And it took her only three weeks to create the spreadsheet after she engaged in a discussion with a classmate asking why Muslims did not condemn violence when perpetrators committed such acts in the name of Islam. So what did Hirat do? She went back to her computer and posted the list to Twitter. And mashallah, it was shared over 15,000 times within just 24 hours. And interestingly enough, two Nigerian software developers stumbled upon her tweet and later developed it into a website that you can now find as uh, muslimscondemn.com. Hirat uh, was born in India and she moved to Colorado at a young age. She's also a graduate of the University of Colorado where she earned a bachelor's degree in molecular biology. MashaAllah. Hirat, salam alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for having me on. MashaAllah, what a beautiful voice you have. Oh, subhanAllah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I just got home. Uh, we have guests over, and we we were taking them out. And Subhanallah, time flies very fast when you're when you're enjoying. So, <laughs> no, it's totally fine. Um, it's a crazy time for all of us. It sounds like all three of us have family over at our places, so we'll be hearing monkeys in the background. I think. <laughs> You know, you actually came to our mind, um, Ismail Royer. We were yeah. talking about your Mabruk, work. Mabruk. Allah barik fiki, barik. We were talking about your work, mashallah, oh, this- and what a powerhouse you are. And, and so I'm really excited. And Summer, who's really the seasoned host here tonight, um, she's done many episodes here with the Mad Mom Luke's. I'll let her go ahead and, and speak for herself. Jazakallah khair. Thank you, Noor. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I would call myself seasoned. I have been on a few of the um, episodes. And alhamdulillah, it's been a great experience to have a seat at the table and, you know, voice some of my opinions and ideas. I'm more and more excited about having more female guests and having a more another female host so that we can kind of diversify our voices and show that, you know, yeah, we're all women, but we all have a lot of, you know, unique and independent thoughts and contributions, which we can see from your um, work. So um, just excited to have you on. Oh, just like both of you are so kind. I mean, if any, I'm the one who's super, super excited, especially uh, Noor. I mean, I see some, like what you write online and I'm just like, wow, subhanAllah, these are amazing people. And just to, that opportunity to talk with you guys is, is really exciting for me. I mean, this is a pretty fascinating introduction for anyone let alone a 19 year old so i'm gonna just ask you the most obvious question are you human (laughs) uh you know with the lack of sleep i've been getting these days i don't feel very human but (laughs) but it you know alhamdulillah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts barakah in in, in your time so it's uh, it's interesting yeah you really don't get any sleep because um 
I think even though you're two hours behind us, I'm here on the East Coast in New York. Um, summer's over in Chicago and you're in Colorado. So even though you're only two hours behind us, I was up late last night. I got the munchies and woke up at like 3, 3.30 in the morning. Not a proud moment for me. But it was interesting because I saw you tweeting. I think you were tweeting back and forth with Biker Nikalbi. And I'm thinking to myself, does this girl ever sleep? What does she do? <laughs> does she just live on Twitter? And and what you're are you also still in school right now? Yeah. I mean, I just finished finals last week, so I was hoping for a a few days of solace, but um, you know, there's a lot of things going on. I was at a, a conference, a Malaysian conference yesterday or the past few days and then inshallah tomorrow I'm actually going to be in Chicago for Masikna, so Mashallah. It's just a constant cycle of stuff. But I like being busy. I like feeling like I'm putting my time to good use. And I think that's really the only thing that keeps me going. If it weren't for that, I'd be in bed all day. It's <laughs> just sleeping. Well, when I first heard about the list, 712 page list in three weeks, I'm thinking, um, did she have like a software program digging for all of this information? How could you have like compiled that? That's amazing. Oh, Jazakallah khair. I mean, I finally found a good use for my researching skills, I guess. But uh, I mean, don't tell my mom. I kind of dished a few classes to do this. <laughs> she's she's watching mom or she's listening, mom. I'm so sorry. But, you know, the fact that I was able to do it in three weeks is really telling of itself that you know that the fact that there are so many muslims speaking out uh, against violence and in the name of religion the fact that i was able to do it so quickly and so easily uh, i think is telling of itself so did you anticipate the immense traction that this list was going to gain did you think that yeah this is gonna make a you know big splash no, not at all. Not at all. I, you know, Biker Nakabi on Twitter, uh, many of uh, people who follow both of us, we're, we've been very close for a long time. And she was the first person I told about this list when I told her, you know, this happened in class and I've been working on this. And I actually shared the list with her and she was like, you know, this would be something that's amazing to make public. And I wasn't sure how people would respond, but I do what any sane human being does when they want to make something public and tweeted it. And subhanAllah, I went to sleep and I woke up and there were over thousands of retweets and messages of people saying, you know, this is something amazing. And I, even now I kind of look back and I'm like, subhanAllah, I don't know what it was um, that had this type of reaction, but I'm, I'm glad that this is something that people like, and this is something that they're putting to good use even now. I was actually going to ask you that. Um, what, what about it do you think allowed it to go viral? Why do you think so many Muslims latched onto it? Uh, there is a couple different things. I think one of the things is oftentimes when we're confronted with bigotry, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'll be the, the first person to respond this way. We kind of want to come back with the sweet comeback or be super, quote unquote, savage or very, you know, witty. And I think the fact that I kind of sat down and I thought about it from a more factual perspective and a more, uh, you know, viewpoint of I want to educate someone. I think that was something at which and I kind of surprised myself because I'm the first person who loves to be witty. I love to have sweet comebacks and be like, wow, you know, I'm I'm so witty. But this time I really sat down and with the purpose of, hey, I don't want to just educate him, but I do want to educate the public. And I think that's something that I invested so much time and people kind of liked that. The fact that, you know, she's not just arguing from you know, a humanist, a humanitarian perspective, but she's, you know, bringing up all this data. She's using her resources. And plus, you know, my Googling skills are pretty, pretty top notch. <laughs> so it's because it's a, a combination of a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, something that actually I walked away thinking about um, is something that you said when you were being interviewed uh, regarding the... Uh, sort of infamy of this list you said that muslims are held to a different standard than other minorities yes. right and that yes. 1.6 billion people are expected to apologize and condemn terrorism for example on behalf of a couple of a dozen lunatics and that it makes no sense um it, having had this conversation with plenty of of other muslims i i find that some are of the opinion that there are real and serious implications around pandering to Western misconceptions of Muslims and Islam, yeah. right? And in, in some ways, maybe some of them could potentially view Muslims condemn as an instance of this. And I'm, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on that. 
Yeah. So since the one, uh, the list went viral, there was some of the feedback was exactly that, that the fact that this list existed meant that there was something in the first place that we had to apologize for. Right. And, right. you know, when I was having that discussion with the classmate, that's what my first approach was. I did try to, uh, you know, kind of debate with him and tell him like, hey, you know, just like. I don't hold you accountable for a lot of these other crimes done by people who look like you on a face value. Uh, you know, it's not fair to hold Muslims to that same standard. You know, there's 1.7 billion of us. There's majority of us are good people, inshallah, I hope. And, you know, there's always going to be criminals in any group, regardless of what their theology is, regardless of what they follow. And he was still very stubborn. And I think I think Sheikh Yasser Qadi had a great point about this, is that, yeah, we can argue with logic when it comes to, you know, facing bigotry. But at the same time, you have to understand the human psyche. Absolutely. And that's and that's something that I try to do is we we have to approach it. What I think is we have to approach it from both ways. On one end, we do have to ask them what causes them to ask this question in the first place. Like, what is the reason that you even have this question of why are Muslims silent and why must they apologize? But then also show them that, you know, that question itself is based on a f- incorrect uh, understanding of Muslims and you know, we can talk a little bit about, you know, what factors there are, like, you know, media bias and things like that. But we do also have to pro- because this is something a lot of uh, famous talk show hosts and a lot of people with a lot of influence actually believe. They actually believe Muslims are very silent. And you'll see this every time there's an attack is these mm-hmm. people who have like thousands of followers and they all think this. And I think we do have to approach it from both ways where we kind of you know, show them these are the facts, the facts say otherwise, but then also kind of provoke them to think, why is it that you think like this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I wonder, um, in in this specific case, did you have any follow up conversations with this uh, peer of yours after the list went viral? Yeah, I did, actually. And he was still very, very stubborn. He did apologize for being like, well, he wasn't rude. I don't think he was rude, but he did apologize for coming. He's like, I'm sorry if I came across as aggressive. Like, you know, I, I don't think you're evil or anything. I was like, yeah, thanks. Thank you for thinking I'm not evil. But, <laughs> um, you know, he was still stubborn. And but the thing is, is that even though Allah SWT didn't show me results, you know, regarding him, there were so many other people after that who came to the MSA office and they were like, you know, this list it's not the list itself, but what this list did is it made me question what else am I learning about Muslims from the media that isn't true? Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. what it kind of did is it kind of provoked people to think think critically like, OK, all these facts that we assume to be true, clearly, you know, they're not. And it, it, it kind of pushed a lot of people into doing a lot of research about Islam that didn't have to deal, you know, that wasn't just limited to certain news stations or anything like that. Mm-hmm. I- that's one of the most um, crucial points there that you're kind of cracking that facade, right? Cracking this facade of Islamophobia and all of this, like Muslims are evil that has been mm-hmm. painted and worked on so um, diligently by the media to make this picture of us. And if you're if you're putting cracks in that uh, picture, then that's really amazing because that's going to lead these people to research more and understand more. But like you're saying, it's really crazy that, you know, this this uh, peer of yours, even with all of this, you know, logical, factual proof, he's still stubborn. And we're thinking that, OK, maybe this is appealing to his human psyche. But I was listening to why people have this, you know, um, why it's so hard for them to even accept factual news sometimes, right? If it just goes against what they personally believe, it's always about feeling like, okay, this person is an other. And because they're not part of my group that I identify with, therefore they must be, um, they must be wrong or they just must be dangerous. And it comes from like this kind of deep evolutionary idea that, okay, I have to protect the people that are within my group. And so after listening to, to I believe it was like a TED talk about it. After listening to that, I realized, subhanAllah, you know, a lot of Muslims, they do go out of their way to show that they're American or show that, look, we eat chicken wings and watch football too. And initially I kind of was like, well, why do we have to eat chicken wings and watch football to be, you know, human beings, to be um, worthy of value or respect? But really it comes into that psyche, right, of 
okay, I'm not so much of an other that I can't relate to you in cultural things or I can't relate to you in some other things that we can both share similarities from. Yeah, but yeah. this is where I struggle because it almost, first of all, that kind of like forging human connections to me just seems so artificial and inauthentic. When we're so fixated on that, what we end up doing unwittingly is investing far too much time in coming across as agreeable and assimilating and that sort of thing, as opposed to really understanding our Dean and not just inheriting it. And, and that's where, you know, I have some sympathy and empathy for those who are critical of these kinds of initiatives as great as they are, as outstanding as they um, seem to be. There, there are questions there about the long-term implications yeah and my other thing my other problem and i because i before the list went viral i wasn't very involved you know with uh i guess the activist world quote unquote i wouldn't call myself an activist but recently i noticed and it's interesting because summer said the word relate is i understand because i'm a you know biology major i understand from a human perspective we fear what isn't like us right because the minute right. something becomes related to us if we look at them in a negative way that kind of Im implies that we're sort of negative in some way shape or form and we don't want to do that mm -hmm. but my, my question is why do we have to relate or why do we have to you know people are are always like let's focus on the similarities i'm like why do you have to be similar to someone in order to respect them mm -hmm. and accept them that's my thing i feel like our greater our, the strength actually lies in the fact that we're able to accept each other because we're different you see what i'm saying like yeah absolutely. you know exactly like you're saying it's not necessarily that you know whenever we are culturally similar or whenever we are you know doing things just like them that's whenever gain the respect and dignity because you can look easily at like the african-american community or the latino community that share you know the same religion similar food go to church um you know listen to the same music all those kinds of things and yet african-americans don't necessarily have you know as much respect or have you know there's still so much racism and so i was thinking like we don't need a muslim beyonce or you know Exactly, exactly. You know, to validate ourselves as human beings, as worthy of respect, as worthy of, you know, um, dignity. And, and it's just really difficult to find, OK, what's going to help us overcome that, you know? Yeah. And that's a huge problem. And I think it's a two way street because what happens is the people here or, or and, and any human being will do this is that we'll only kind of accept what reminds us of ourselves and what ends up happening on the other side of the coin is that we feel like we have to continuously pander to their like we have to push ourselves through a cardboard cutout of what mm -hmm. they view as a human being what ends up happening is we start to sacrifice small aspects of our being like for example you know recently there was a, a you know people were complaining like oh no we need a black hijabi model on the show and i'm mm -hmm. like subhanallah we don't have to Equality doesn't mean doing everything that they do. We can be different and still be accepted. You know what I mean? And, and it becomes, you know, we, that's the beauty of our deen is like we are different and we don't have to be like you and it, be like people here it, it, with the only difference of, oh, I wear a hijab, you know. And I was having a conversation with a friend about this today about you know it's it's the, the primary indication of being some uh, being a muslim should not be what i look like it should be our character and it should be the things that we do and the things that we we say uh but instead uh here in this culture what ends up happening is there's we have this need to do everything that people here do and there's really nothing that separates us and there's no line between oh this person's a muslim uh versus someone who's not mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, yeah, listening to you talk about this is actually reminding sorry. me of um it's reminding me of a psychologist who's fairly well known she had an amazing ted talk her name's uh Brene brown i don't know if you've heard of her uh but her, yeah. she's she's spoken quite a bit about the importance of cultivating empathy and specifically what she calls intellectual empathy and intellectual empathy is being able to place yourself in the logical mindset of your, uh, I guess, debate, you know, the person you're debating or the person you're having a conversation with, you know, your opponent, for lack of a better word. So in, in terms of the peer Hirat, that you um, were challenged by, um, this would look like him being able to at least follow your train of thought as a Muslimah 
and withhold judgment as best as he can, recognize the emotions that you're carrying as a human being. And the point of similarity or connection is just the fact that he can understand that you have emotions just like he has emotions as a human being without necessarily inauthentically trying to say, yes, I, I know how you feel as a Muslim woman, right? Because that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that to me feels like a far more authentic and genuine way of connecting with people across lines of difference because it's it's great for us to sit here and say, you know, we, we should be able to accept and tolerate our differences. But in practice, this is very difficult to do, especially yeah. in a very charged Islamophobic and Islamo racist climate. So what I like about Brene Brown's work is that she makes this very concrete and tangible for people. Um, and, and in being able to engage in very heated conversations with people who don't think and who staunchly disagree with you. Yeah, that sounds I think you'll have to send me that because uh, or send me some of her work because that sounds like exactly what it is, because in an ideal world, we would hope that, you know, uh, we don't have to be able to relate to someone in order to respect them. But I think, again, it comes back to human nature and human psyche. The way Allah SWT has built us is we're very uh, emotional creatures. Um, mm -hmm. And it's it's really you know, you can debate someone all you want with logic and facts and things like that. But in the end, it's the heart that moves. That's right. That's right. And and there's even research out there, um, psychology research that shows that, you know, people sit and deliberate big decisions on spreadsheets and create like a pros and cons column. You know, let's say they're trying to buy a car or buy a house or even choose a spouse and they'll go through this like very intense, logical deliberation. But in the end, what they base their decision on is their emotion. That mm -hmm. is so telling to me. Yeah, I agree completely. The way, you know, I, even my parents, I remember when or when I was deciding where to go to college, you know, the, my brain would tell me like, you know, logically, this is the best place to go. It has the best academic program. But my heart was like, I love the mountains and yeah. I want to be with my family. And that's where I'm going to be, even if, you know, I the major I wanted is not there or whatever is not there. And that's that's how it that's how we are. And yep. it can be really hard to work with that sometimes. But Absolutely. Speaking of emotions, um, let's go back to your adolescent years for a second, because oh boy, <laughs> you're, you're not yeah. just <laughs> you're not just amazing at 19. You were pretty amazing at 13, right? Published your first novel, Shadow Speed, and then again at 15, you released uh, Crimson Ruins and The Liars. So oh that my God, y'all y'all did your research, okay? <laughs> <laughs> we want to know who you are, girl. How'd you? Oh. Know? What's going on? Uh, I mean, I was always a writer. I wasn't even now I get nervous when I talk in public speaking for someone who public speaks a lot sometimes or and I'm kind of quote, forced into it sometimes kind of. Um, I really love to write. I feel like, you know, especially in my head, there's a lot of thoughts going on all the time. And writing is a way for me. It's a form of catharsis. And it's also a way to organize and kind of put words to feelings that sometimes feel indescribable in my head. So when I was young, especially growing up, uh, I was online schooled in middle school because of, you know, there was discrimination and things like that when I was in elementary school. So my parents pulled me out for a few years. And when I went back, it was odd. It was there were a few things in my personal life, for example, our house had actually burned down at the time. So we were really being tested as a family. Uh, so I turned to writing as a form of just you know it was something that was mine and I felt like I can do whatever I want and it's for me and then my mom came across my manuscript and you know she was like you know this isn't half bad for a 13 year old uh so she and my dad actually found a publisher that publishes books specifically written by young authors so they had that published and that was like one I really appreciate my parents for doing that is whatever passions I've had they've always been the first people to support that alhamdulillah Thing. Yeah. Good job, mom and dad. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> how do you feel like your values and beliefs um, come into your writing? Well, at that time, I was just writing for fun. So my books aren't, you know, people they see where I am now and they assume it's like great literature in any, uh, or, uh, or something. I'm like, honestly, they're awful. <laughs> it's not the best books you'll ever read. But I do think uh, a lot of my worries, especially Shadow Speed, the first book, it, it was very violent, actually. It's, it was quite, it was about war, uh, a fictional World War Three, And I think at that time, 
you know, facing discrimination and things like that. It, for me, mm. it was, I wrote a lot about, you know, uh, being able to stand up in times of trial. You know, there's a war going on and there's so many things happening and these characters were strong and resilient. And I think that was kind of a reflection of what I wanted to be and where I wanted to be at. Um, and then as, as I got older, I started writing for fun. And now, alhamdulillah, I, I'm trying to write, I still have a lot of ideas to write books and, uh, and I'm hoping to kind of focus on a Muslim audience. And it's a bit of a niche, you know, Muslim Islamic fiction, quote unquote. But mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I do want to pen books that, especially growing up in this country, all the examples of Muslims you see in media, there was a study, it was like 80% of Muslims in media are portrayed in a negative manner. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything from TV shows to, you know, just news to to cartoons and i kind of want to come in with a different narrative and be like you know it's not that we can be heroes despite being muslim but it's because we can be heroes because of our religion absolutely so yeah absolutely inshallah. that's such a great point and i you know i know we keep fixating on your age but i i guess my qualifier there is you come from a generation that is probably more uh vocal and prominent and elevated in terms of the Muslim voice. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about, you know, social justice warriors and centennial hijabis who come onto the scene and really um, are advocating for a variety of different ideas. So when you're thinking about the literature that you hope to one day continue to write, what are some of the themes and sort of... uh, life lessons that you hope to impart on centennials? That is a really good question. Um, For me, especially because a lot of my writing does come back to me. It's not, it's not, it's not a selfish type of writing per se, but a lot of what I write, I think it's, I really want it to be sincere and I feel like it can only be sincere if it's something that I'm passionate about. And one of the few things I'm really passionate about is this idea of not worrying about what people think, and really living your life for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, I, in high school, I faced the same issues of peer pressure and this idea of I want to fit in. And there was a point where one of my friends, she was a Christian and she was born and raised here. And she told me, she's like, Hera, because, you know, they pronounce my name Hera. And she was like, I've never felt like I fit in, even though I've been here my whole life. So I can't imagine where you are. And that kind of hit me that regardless of hmm. what background people come from, everyone experiences this sort of where they feel like they're floating and they don't quote unquote fit in. And that's, Mm -hmm. especially when you get older and you kind of look back on your young years and even in college, you've experienced this to an extent where you've, you know, I'm in a science, I'm in the science department. I want to fit in with whatever I'm researching or whatever. And so that's one of the themes I want to write about is when you only worry about, uh, pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala everything else, all of those other worries kind of fade into the background. Uh, It's very interesting because you actually also recently tweeted something that goes in line with that. You said, don't change the deen for a fleeting moment of acceptance from people who don't matter when it's the akhirah we should constantly work towards. Um, And I thought that was a really valuable uh, nugget of wisdom. And, you know, one of one of the most obvious ways, waves of change across the ummah today is the movement for Muslim reform. Which I'm sure you've yes. you know been exposed to oh. and you've written about, um, <laughs> and you know for listeners, obviously I'm sure they're very attuned to this as well. That there are many Muslims in our community who believe in, for example, a reinterpretation of the Quran and the Hadith, one that reigns in women as the interpreters. And being that the three of us here are women, I'm very curious to know what your thoughts on this are. A lot of, I mean, the reformers that I've encountered, I'm sure there are a lot, some out there who are very learned, but oftentimes it seems to be people who, you know, it's not that they're educated and they, they've studied the deen and they're like, okay, I actually believe that this ruling should be this. It's usually from people who, I don't know, I mean, not to label them as like, oh, they just want to be accepted, but it seems like it's coming from a place where it's not true to the deen, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. Um and on a lot of the time, when I see these new rulings, you know, my friend will mention like, oh, but I heard this like f- ruling that actually this is permissible when it's not. It's it's interesting to me because I feel like these days Islam is kind of viewed as an as an identity, which it is. But primarily it's a way of life. And the reason I kind of emphasize this is because identity is something that 
changes depending on what you feel and what you think. Whereas a way of life, I'm constantly trying to change myself to fit the ideal of a Muslim in Islam, Mm -hmm. right? The, The deen doesn't change to suit me. And it shouldn't change. The deen is there for, you know, for everyone. And I'm constantly, I'm on this journey to make sure I become the most perfect version of myself before I meet my Lord, inshallah. Inshallah. Yeah, we all, we all have to aspire to that. What do you think of the statement that we oftentimes hear that, um, you know, religion is a, it's a personal thing and um, it's nobody's business and it's really just between you and God? I mean, on one level, it is, yeah, when it comes to uh, taqwa, when it comes to piety, and when it comes to, you know, belief, yeah, that is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when you look at, like, the example of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Islam is not just limited to you and God. It's, it, Islam also is there between people. It's between, you know, any relationship in my family, uh, with a spouse, with your children, with community members. Islam has its roots in every single aspect of life. And so when we say that it's only between me and God, you're really limiting yourself to all these other beautiful things that Islam gives you. Because again, it's not about what you do for Islam. It's about what Islam gives you. Mm-hmm. And Islam gives you so much guidance in every other aspect of life that when you say like, oh, you know, it's nobody else should comment on this. It's just me and God. You're really cutting yourself off from all this, these, these other things that Islam tells you about how to interact with your neighbors and your co-workers and how to be, you know, a contributing member of society as an American Muslim. Mm-hmm. I feel beautiful. what a lot of uh, Dad Muslims will hear that and be like, see, we told you Sharia law, not, <laughs> not just about praying and what, you know, burgers you eat. It's really everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're talking it is some everything. creeping Sharia um, right now, Hira. So, oh, no. Any, any but... qualifying statements? Uh, but you know sharia is the reason that i i do all of this or like you know if it weren't for sharia i wouldn't be able to uh you know serve the community like i do so you know really it's all it's all benefiting us Mm -hmm. i think um kind of where the fear comes in is that whenever we say islam gives us all these rules and ways of life and how to interact with everyone i think the fear comes in whenever they're afraid that we're going to impose those same rules and those same um ideologies on others without their consent in some like but it's like sharia preventing us from forcing you to do anything so yeah that surface level understanding that keeps them in fear yeah Mm -hmm. some are actually in line with what you just mentioned i'm reading um a text by a muslim feminist one of the things that she says in the introduction of her book is so she's she's kind of sharing a vignette of an experience that she had with a fellow Muslim feminist that she was out to lunch with one day. This is in like the early 90s. And they happened to pass by a restaurant and they were struck by the fact that all of the women attending this event at this restaurant were wearing hijab. And she says, Mm -hmm. you know, at this time in the United States, it's, you know, 1990, it wasn't really common to see such a sight. And her friend turned to her and said, look at them. Those are our enemies. And then she went on to elaborate and describe what she meant there in the sense that hijab for these women who grew up in Egypt during the 1960s under the quote unquote force of the Muslim Brotherhood, the hijab was a symbol of tyranny and oppression. And, you know, I'm not going to lie. There was a part of my heart that, like, really ached in in reading those words. And I know that the three of us wear hijab. So when you hear something like this, when you hear about fellow Muslims who don't wear the hijab, feeling like we are their enemies, what what's your sense in of, of that? It it's it's sad because you know I feel really sad when I hear stuff like that because it's like we're all on the same side you know we're all on the same side against shaitan so but on that kind of on that no um a few days ago I was listening to Sheikh Yasser Qadi's debunking the male bias I don't know if both of you yep. or any of you have heard that yeah because I used to be that person um when people were like okay why can men have four wives but women can't and you know you would always argue from a worldly perspective right and when I listened to that lecture I realized that. Because it's not the norm here, we have to explain ourselves why we do something out of the norm. But if you think about it, why we, it could be it's it's true the other way around. Right. Mm-hmm. We could just as easily ask them, you know, the same thing. And I think there was an incident with a brother where a co-worker asked him, like, you know, why don't you shave? And he's like, well, why do you shave? Right. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so it was interesting listening to that because you think about it and it's, it's very subjective. It's a very, you know, like we're here, Muslims in America, we constantly feel like we have to explain ourselves and our differences to people here. But just as easily, we could ask them to explain why their way of life is very different from ours. That's because, true. That's true. Yeah. But don't you think somebody could turn around and say, yeah, but you as Muslims are very indoctrinating. I mean, your oh, faith basically... Argument. Your faith basically delineates uh, black and white terms. You know, if if shirk is involved, then you go to hell. So that's not subjective. <laughs> uh, you know, I am just a student of knowledge. Yeah. I mean, if someone wants to go first. <laughs> oh, no. I would really like to tell people that, you know, we are all indoctrinated in some shape or form. Yes. When you choose Islam, then you're saying, okay, this is going to be what tells me what's right and wrong whereas other people may be using movies and music and weird superstitions and i've seen people like that or you know they start using other humanistic kind of like oh i'm a vegetarian so vegetarianism rules my whole worldview right yeah and there there was a thread i did on this because the indoctrinating argument is very i mean i don't consider it sound logic just because anything can be argued to be indoctrinating right because i think this was in the context of there was a, there were a few people on twitter who were upset that um a mother had posted a picture with her daughter wearing hijab um and they were like you know stop making your children wear hijab that's indoctrinating and i'm like you know when you tell your children not to eat something or to eat something that's indoctrinating um you know forcing them quote unquote forcing them to wear clothes that's indoctrinating anything mm-hmm. can be uh you know, argue to be indoctrinating. And as Summer said, as a Muslim, you know, that means to submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as a person, when I've submitted my will to, uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I've kind of, what I've done is made the decision to follow whatever commands he's given us to the best of my ability. Um, and that's what I'm using as my a foundation for my morality. Right. So, I mean, I mean, I'm still learning, so I'm really interested in what you guys have to say about that. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I I think between both of your statements, really the thing to take away from this question of indoctrination is when it comes to social constructs. But the minute we enter territory that becomes about the divine, we cannot rely solely on logical uh, argumentation because it's a question of faith. And Mm -hmm. questions of faith cannot be proven in terms of logical argumentation, right? That's why you can't prove uh, without a shadow of a doubt the existence or the lack thereof uh, of a divine entity. But, you know, it's it's worth exploring. And I hope you don't mind that I put you on the spot there for a second. Oh, no, not at all. (laughs) No, it's it's a good... mental exercise because i think in the same video he mentioned how you know i mean can you you know my friends are like why do we have to pray five times a day right and it's like you know there are some things in islam we can argue from a worldly perspective right but in the end to explain god using the human capacity that's simply not doable um and yeah part of faith is being able to you know you don't like where is the evidence you need evidence in the first place that's my first point and second of all Part of faith that is, you know, religion. Part of it is being able to believe without having any, um, you know, may, perhaps you may not have tangible evidence. You may get it later in life, or maybe not at all. And you, or you may think you understand uh, one of God's commands from a worldly perspective, but you may be incorrect. So, you know, if there is something in this world that supports, you know, okay, we don't eat pork because you know the meat is bad, or you know, it's it makes it's it's unhealthy or whatever but in the end the wisdom is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we just have to trust him and that you know he knows he created us and he knows us best Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the whole theist atheist argument um not to dwell on this point but it's it's one that I'm always thinking about as somebody who you know struggled with atheism for a decade our western tradition has taught us to look down on uh anything that may seem emotional or value laden that isn't rational that isn't based in logic anything the minute you use the word faith you're already kind of um suggesting or inviting people to raise brows and question how sane you actually are right the moment that you start speaking from a faith-based perspective you lose credibility in our society because our society values secular theory and um To say something like, well, it's just faith, right? Um, I don't have tangible evidence for it. 
you're you're pigeonholed into a debate where you're set up to lose from the very beginning. Yeah. Oh yeah. Then that's just or blind belief. Using your mind at all. <laughs> Yeah, and it was interesting because at CU Boulder, actually, um, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, we had lunch with the uh, with a Lutheran group on campus. And I'm not sure if you guys uh, are aware, but Boulder is a very liberal city. And on top of that, most people are agnostic or atheist. Um, yeah, so most people are actually uh, agnostic or atheist. And so when we were talking with this Lutheran group, the students there even said were they were like, you know, it's hard to be a practicing Christian on campus. And it was really interesting. And they were like, you know, I think it's hard to be a practicing Christian, so I can't imagine how hard it is to be a practicing Muslim. Mm-hmm. But there was one student also also who's in the science department, we were talking about how this sort of uh, dissonance that exists between, you know, science and religion or this perceived uh, disconnect. And we were, you know, when I'm uh, in my department, it's interesting when people see me and they see, you know, a hijabi, they see somebody who's praying, but they also see, you know, she's very scientific. She's, you know, writing research papers and doing research. And they're like, how can you do that if you're religious? And to me, religion and science has always gone hand in hand. And actually, the more I learn about, I'm in molecular biology, learning about the human body and learning about uh, genes, the more I learn, the more it actually solidifies my faith in a divine which is interesting because people mostly will usually perceive otherwise mashallah so speaking of of biology actually and and your background i'm curious to know what your views are on gender sexuality and the lgbtq movement insofar as muslims are concerned oh that is a can of worms that we've opened (laughs) (laughs) I well, mean, it's, it's a big topic in our community right now. It you is. Know? It is. And actually, yesterday, at one of the, I was giving one, a lecture to the youth, and there was a group of girls who came up afterwards, and they were like, you know, we have a friend who's struggling with this. And, you know, I was like, I mean, my answer to them was, you know, go to go ask a sheikha or somebody who's more knowledgeable, because obviously I can't advise on if you're asking about a ruling or something. But I kind of refrain from talking about this online, especially just because I'm still trying to piece together where I stand or more like piece together what the stance should be in Islam. I know, uh, you know, it's homosexual acts are not permissible and Sheikh Yasser Qadi, especially just because my family uh, has known him for a long time. So I do uh, kind of, Im- I am kind of biased towards him. When he came to Colorado, he explained very clearly, you know, the ruling on this and, you know, it's not the desire that itself that's uh, haram, but it's like acting upon it and, 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 and going from there. But when I encounter, you know, my fellow Muslims on campus or people who are struggling with this, I kind of think of it in a way where it's like, you know, everyone has their own journey and their own jihad that they have to overcome. And of course, we shouldn't be shy. You know, when people ask, how does Islam view homosexuality? We shouldn't be shy about it. But at the same time, you know, people will assume that means I'm trying to, you know, you know, people will accuse me, oh, you know, throwing gays off roofs. And I'm like, you know, no, no, that's not what it is at all right and i think we should always be coming from a perspective of empathy and trying to Mm -hmm. understand um whatever sin it is uh whatever sin someone's struggling with or whatever they're struggling with i think that's a great point that you're bringing up because a lot of the time there's lack of nuance right around this issue it's like okay well you know it's haram so therefore everyone who thinks this way or talks about it or even you know opens up and says hey this is something i'm struggling with you know ostracize them and throw them under a bus but really there's a lot of nuance there and islam allows for people to you know everyone's gonna struggle in their lives and i think exactly yeah and whether zina you know like zina for example is a huge sin as well but uh you know or or like there was it was interesting i think uh, i'm not gonna name which uh, masjid i was at but i was at a masjid and there was um a little bit of a scuffle going on and when we figured out what was happening it was basically a brother who um it kind of was made public through rumors and stuff that he was feeling this way and someone else was trying to prevent him from entering the masjid And it was interesting because it's like, you know, we are always inviting Christians and Hindus and people of other backgrounds and, you know, couples who we know very clearly, you know, they're not they're dating and obviously they're, you know, committing zina and stuff. But we have no problem with inviting them and, you know, being friends with them and treating them in a kind manner. So what makes the LGBTQ community different in this way, you know, and especially if it's a brother who he feels this way, but he still wants to come to the masjid and still wants to have that closeness with Allah and 
and struggling to overcome this, we should be the first people to be at his side to help him uh, through this, not, you know, throw him out. Absolutely. Right. Exactly. And it just kind of leads the person further and further down that rabbit hole that they might be going into, you know. Um, yeah. A lot of people, whenever they're they're struggling with even not even just LGBT issues, but other issues, they'll say, oh, well, I didn't find support within the masjid or I didn't find support in my community. So yep. Just yep. whoever was accepting and often the people that are accepting are people who are in the same sin, you know, and that that ends up making it worse sometimes. Exactly. To sin is human, but to make the sin normal is not. And when we push them towards a community where it's indulging in that sin is a okay thing to do and a moral thing to do, that's very problematic. And I don't know, you know, when we answer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how, how are we going to answer that because of something we said or something we did, somebody uh, strayed further from Islam? And that's my worst fear is being responsible for that type of thing. Well, that's a perfect segue into my next question. <laughs> um, so alongside another Muslim, you were recently accused of encouraging Muslim girls to DM guys if they were interested in pursuing them. Oh Allah, I I was, I was like I'm arguing the exact opposite. <laughs> So uh, Sister Hena Zubairi, she had a post because a brother had posted how, you know, uh, peop- girls will slide into guys' DMs, th- you know, being like, oh, you know, Khadija radiallahu anha used to propose or not used to. She proposed to the Prophet uh, you know, she initiated. And I was like, I shared that post because I thought it was very interesting because I was like, yeah, there is a world of difference between sliding into the DMs uh and proposing the way Khadija, Khadija radiallahu anha did, which was, you know, sending someone and doing it, you know, in a very dignified manner. Uh, and then for some reason, someone thought that meant I was endorsing DM sliding. And I was like, no, <laughs> that's not what I'm endorsing at all. Um, Wait, and she so also, are you saying I should retract the three proposals that I recently sent on Facebook? <laughs> Oh, man, I don't know. Just Four kidding. husbands, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> and in the same comment, she also said, I believe women should wait. Um, so, you know, and I was like, yeah, so we shouldn't be on either extreme. We should not be sliding into people's DMs like that. And also we should not be, uh, you know, because she believed that a girl should have to wait. It's the guy who has to initiate. And I think... You know, whichever way it's coming from, it should be done in a halal manner, uh, whether it's, you know, involving your parents, involving um, a mahram and making sure you're not going about this in a way that's not pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I feel, you know, my personal belief and I'm still studying Islam, so I'm still learning. But I do think that it's permissible for the girl to initiate it as well. Why should I have to wait for my Prince Charming when I can be uh, Princess Charming? (laughs) <laughs> it's very interesting because it brings up the topic of feminism, which is another hot topic alongside the LGBTQ topic. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think in recent years, it's it's exploded onto the scene for Muslims. And we're really being taken to task to develop a principled position on this issue. But really, it seems like everywhere you turn, Muslim men and women are arguing either for or against this ideology. So for you, I know you're still sort of developing your positions on all of these big questions. But at this moment, how do you define feminism and what's your understanding of the mission of this movement? If you define feminism as equal opportunity for men and women, then I'm a feminist. But if you look at the way feminism is understood and kind of carried out, in the U.S. or maybe not all of U.S., but where I live, especially... I would not call myself a feminist because the way they understand it is inherently flawed. What happens is they automatically or they inherently assume that whatever a man can do is superior. And so they're like, if a man can do this, a woman should be able to do this. And I'm like, you from the beginning already set uh, what women do as inferior to what men do. So that kind of goes against this idea of like, for example, I had a thread about my mom. She is very educated. She's a very educated woman, but she chose to work from home or be a homemaker. And people will look down on her, uh, down at her thinking, you know, she's uh, being forced to and she, you know, she just herself, she's been brainwashed into believing that, you know, she can do more if she stays at home and whatever. And I'm like, you know, you say the point of feminism is uh, empowering women for choices and stuff, but the way it's actually done in reality or at least the way it looks like to me in the area i'm in it's really about 
forcing women to ad- adhere to their ideology, which I'm not f- a part of. I don't want to be mm-hmm. a part of that. Mm-hmm. So when you say equal opportunity, I mean, that's that's a fairly broad statement, right? Because, I mean, mm-hmm. what is equal opportunity? Is it just like equal wages or are we also saying basically like men should be able to bear children if some sort of scientific uh, discovery <laughs> should allow that? Um, I mean, I'm being facetious right now, but yeah, yeah. really, these are these are the kinds of questions that future generations may end up having to grapple with. And certainly our our era now, we're oh. grappling with questions that our parents and our great grandparents didn't even it wasn't even on the horizon for them. Right. So what do you mean by equal opportunity for both men and women? Mm-hmm. Where where do you draw Maybe- that line? Yeah, maybe I should rectify it uh, to say uh, equity Um, or let's say, okay, maybe I should redefine this as equity in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us already. Um, Because I think the reason a lot of Muslim women will turn to feminism is not because of what Islam says, but the way it's implemented. Right. You know, I'm not I'm not going to deny there's a lot of problems in India as well. There's a lot of oppression, a lot of misogyny, you know, um, men being very abusive to their wives, uh, not letting them work or not letting them go get an education. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's Islamic at all. But what happens is these women or the community starts to associate this with Islam and they'll see feminism as kind of a refuge, right? right? And I feel like if we went back to what Islam said in the first place, there wouldn't be a need for this. Um, okay. So yeah, so if we talk about feminism being, hey, let's go back to the God-given rights, let's go back to what Islam has already given us, then th- yeah, then I agree with that. I'm 130% for that. But if we talk about, you know, uh, Islam, you know, says, you know, the responsibility of a woman is this and a responsibility of a man is that, a man is that, but we should make it otherwise or we should change it, then no. Well, I think it's so important that you bring up the, you know, the, the idea of, look, there's a paradigm in which you're thinking that men are already superior and that's mm-hmm. what women to strive and that's the standard we should strive for exactly and the idea that oh okay because a man works i should also work but even that is coming from such a place of privilege because i know in uh like for example in pakistan there are so many women who work and it's never looked at oh she's like an empowered feminist that's why she gets to go out and work but it's really a bare necessity of her family that she has to work and then within that society and that paradigm the women who are of upper classes and who don't have to work then that's seen as okay you are better taken care of but it just comes from you know what is the paradigm that your society is in yeah and my dad says a similar thing he's like you know if i didn't have to work if i could you know own a business or whatever i would do that he sees you know being a homemaker as superior to working so it's it's when here when people are like, you know, women should go out and work and things like that. It's coming, like, as you said, from a place of misunderstanding and privilege. Well, and yeah, I mean, I mean, think about it. Think about how much power you have as a homemaker in terms of and Summer and I both have experience as being educators. So we probably are on the same page about the power that you have as a mother to educate and um, impart and instill values in the character of children, you're building a society is what you're doing. And I can't imagine what would be more powerful than that. Yeah. And on that thread that I had about my mom, there were so many people who are like, oh, she wasted her degrees, you know, just to change nappies and cook. And I don't know, somebody was like, you know, yeah. And they were like, maybe, you know, she wasted all that money. You know, why isn't she going back and earning? And I'm like, because you're measuring contribution to society by money. Honestly, it all comes down to money because you're measuring the contribution of my mom to her society or contribution of anyone. People, the way they measure it here is through money. And I'm like, my mom put her education to good use. She raised three daughters, three badass. Oh, can I, I don't know if I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> three super like awesome daughters who are contributing to society in any capacity. So I'm, I don't know why people like uh, insist on measuring success through numbers because you know, raising children, you know, great children is something that's immeasurable. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and I, and you know, the Oma is built uh, by mothers. That's so. right. And it's amazing, like the impact that that home environment can have. But I feel like for at least for my mother's generation, 
they had very clear expectations of them. You know, my mother was like, okay, I'm going to be a homemaker. I'm going to take really great care of my kids. And that was where she kind of like established herself. And that's where she also had her um, confidence, right? And whereas I see in my generation and a lot of the girls around me, now coming into motherhood, especially with younger children, we're we're feeling really pulled. I've worked part time. I've worked full time. Um, I've stayed at home as well for you know different amounts of time. And there's always this push and pull of okay, what's expected of me? Whenever I'm at home, I'll always get questions. Well, why aren't you working? And then whenever I am working, I'll always get questions. Well, who's with your kids? You know, so that constant like push and pull of okay, where am I deriving my value from? And then it really takes a lot of introspection and, you know, kind of deciding for yourself, like what is going to be, be your contribution. Mm-hmm. That's a great point, Summer. Very good point. It doesn't always come from a place of privilege. I know so many women who do have to go out and work and do make their mark in like their careers and stuff. And so, um, yeah, it reminds me of an incident. I think there was a viral video um, about a woman in India and she was uh, like, I think it was like they have rickshaws over there and she was a rickshaw driver. And the video was like, look at her. She's going out and working in a society where women aren't expected to work. And people were celebrating her for being this like, you know, trailblazing feminist. And I was like, this is she is from a poor family. They are abused they and she has to go out and work and earn because the society over there in the village she lived in like it's a very uh hierarchical uh, system and they're not allowing her to go get educated they're not allowing her to uh go do anything um and so she's forced into this position where she has to earn when she shouldn't have to and it's just weird because people here were celebrating her as this sort of like feminist and i'm like no this is a problem. <laughs> Look at the society. The society, we should be looking at the society and thinking about what is it in the system that's forcing people uh, to go out and do this for barely a few cents a day. So, in your opinion, what do you think centennials should do to wrap their minds around like the history and the mission of feminism? Uh, study a lot, read up on the history of feminism. Uh, read a lot of different viewpoints and i think it comes down to that you know she and uh, uh, nora was talking about that psychologist is reading up and kind of understanding their position so you can better uh formulate a position that sort of is more balanced i guess because a lot of times any position you look at is has flaws you know whether it's one side or another uh in india where our villages, a lot of people turn to feminism as this thing that can kind of uh, allow them to escape the situation they're in just because the way the society is set up and the way the political system is set up. Uh, But if you look at it, you know, even going to that side doesn't give them everything that they need. And I really think that when we show them that, no, the Islam is really the position that we need to look at. We need to look at what Islam gives us and go from there rather than looking at different ideologies. Because again, every ideology is coming from a point that's a little bit flawed, right? Western feminism is coming from a point of uh, view where Western ideals are true and vice versa. So if you go East uh, and it's just about finding a balance and going back to what Islam teaches us about women and how Islam honors women and, and things like that. So um, I wanted to go on to our next point here. So you, you've been referred to as the icon of Muslim confidence, which that's huge statement, right? Um, and back in September, Sheikh Omar Suleiman introduced you at the Iknamas convention as someone who intimidates him. Which, <laughs> mashallah, he's like six foot plus. Um, that's that that's a really big statement. So mashallah, we can easily understand though why he used the term confident to describe you. But one of the things that I find interesting is what what's that imply about Muslims as a total group? So. In other words, by highlighting one Muslim, and a woman no less, as confident, what are we implicitly saying about Muslims in general? I mean, to start off, I was really the one intimidated. You know, the first thing I said to him when I met him was, you're really tall. <laughs> and he was like, thanks. I've heard that like 30 times today. I hope that implies or, in you know is a reflection of our ummah as a whole. I hope that it's a reflection that we're getting to a place where we're confident about who we are um, and that we're 
unapologetically Muslim. We're not afraid to kind of talk about these controversial issues or um, learn about what our deen is and kind of share that with others. And I hope that's what the award kind of uh, gave to people because the I don't think the award for, was for me. The award was for the youth and how we're beginning to become confident in our own skin as Muslims and as Americans. One of the things that uh, Summer and I were actually talking about before you joined us on the call is like, you know, the uh, complex that sometimes uh, success can create in individuals. And it's it's just a human reaction. Everybody who experiences rapid success, I would imagine, goes through that sort of experience where my understanding of imposter syndrome is where, you know, you're basically seen as an icon or this amazing figure and to you you're like i'm not <laughs> like i'm actually not that yeah great. is that <laughs> right someone yeah. will feel it even more than men anyone who you know goes into a successful career or gets like a successful uh promotion or a position and like they may even be considered experts in the field but they don't necessarily see themselves as that and especially as someone who you know is is getting an award and getting this rapid success do you feel like you've felt that or if you haven't then how have you um you know combated it it's interesting i there are moments where it's like you know i didn't really do anything i don't understand why i have the follower count that i do or why so many people are willing to listen to what i say even though half the time i'm incoherent and i prefer to write and that's why i prefer to write and tweet all the time um and there are moments too i've had a few times where people will recognize me in real life and it's always a worry it's like wow what if i don't measure up to what their idea of me is and it comes back to that idea of I don't, you know, everything that's been happening, alhamdulillah, it's all because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the blessings that he's granted me and my family. And I think when you really have that in mind, it really helps me keep not, you know, not be too insecure, but also not be too arrogant and be like, you know, this is, of course, you know, I'm great. I'm amazing. Like, alhamdulillah, I do think uh, I, I'm trying to continue to do good work and things like that, but uh, also not I try, especially because you get a lot of comments all the time. And, you know, it's hard because you tell yourself, you know, there's just people online, but then you get a lot of hate comments and it start it does take a toll on you. But just having, first of all, Biker Naqabi, she's an amazing person, mashallah, if you ever meet her in person. She, uh, I think, is one person for me that really helps me uh, keep, keep that balance of not feeling like, you know, it's okay uh, to feel like, you don't deserve this, but it's not for me to decide. It's not for me to decide what I deserve and what I don't deserve. It's it's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. MashaAllah. That's great. Very outdated, humility-based response. <laughs> and it, yeah, and I think also I'm a little bit scared of my followers, so that kind of keeps me uh, from going a little bit too nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so for, for anyone who's not following you, where can they find you? What is your handle on Twitter? Cave Hera. And there's, you know, Ghare Hera, the cave of Hera. Yep, that's that's the story. Cave Hera on Twitter. Awesome. Great. And speaking of Twitter, don't forget to follow the Mad Mamluks on Twitter. And don't forget yes, to like us do. on Facebook. Our uh, group is expanding, alhamdulillah. And uh, we want to continue to do this great work for the community. Hera, thank you so very, very much for devoting some of your very precious and limited time to speaking with us tonight. It was such a pleasure and an honor. No, Jazakumullah khair. This was an amazing opportunity for me. I follow you guys on Twitter and I've been a huge fan for a long time. So it's just, it's almost unreal that I'm uh, be, uh, able to be on one of your episodes now. Thank you so much, Hira. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>